afternoon. I'm Jana Meyer, an Associate Curator of Collections at the Filson Historical Society. I'm so glad that you joined us today, both per in person and virtually for today's lecture for the failure of Shipping Port Square, urban renewal on the waterfront. After the conclusion of the lecture, we invite you to visit the companion exhibit, Forgotten Foundations, Louisville's Lost Architecture, which is located in the Carriage House. Our speaker, Max Brown, earned two bachelor's degrees from the University of Louisville in 2018 in history and Spanish. He further graduated from the University of Kentucky in fall 2021 with an MA in history and has plans to continue his studies in pursuit of a PhD. Currently, he serves as the AIA CKC Fellow for the Filson Historical Society, aiding in the processing and archiving of the Jasper Ward Architectural Collection. He also teaches history at Jefferson Community and Technical College in Louisville. I will return to moderate questions after the presentation as time permits. Um, if you have a question, you'll come to the microphone um, at the front of the room. Or if you're joining us virtually, um, please go ahead and drop your questions in the chat. Please join me in welcoming Max Brown. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you all for being here. Uh, very excited. If I speak a bit fast, I do apologize. Uh, I'll try to move at an even clip. Um, yeah, like Jana said, this is the failure of shipping Fort Square, urban renewal on the waterfront. Um, this is essentially a story of Louisville uh, trying to reinvent itself uh, in the mid 20th century. Um, first off, before we get too deep into shipping Fort Square and its story, I kind of want to talk a bit about urban renewal. Um, urban renewal is typically understood as the process of clearing a city's blighted or decrepit areas to make way for new constructions and housing, business, or public use. Um, blight is kind of a broad term um, that we're going to see used a lot in terms of urban in relation to urban renewal. Um, urban blight also is called urban decay. It's kind of more of its recent kind of nomenclature. Um, it refer, refers basically to sort of a general disrepair or disuse of buildings or even whole districts within an urban center. Um, urban renewal then can kind of be understood as an attempt to clear away the blight and sort of create a new identity for a city. Uh, this often relates to what you'd call white flight, um, which was kind of a big problem in a lot of American cities in the 1950s and 60s, wherein more affluent members of a community um, essentially flocked away from city centers and into suburbs kind of on the city's exteriors. Um, <clears throat> The Urban Renewal Commission in Louisville began their work in the mid 20th century. They branched off the Department of Building and Housing in 1962. Um, and with about 80, over 80 million approved and project capital grants, they set out to create a new urban city well fitted to be the focus of a dynamic metropolitan region, um, which have been created out of underused, misused, or blighted areas, which was how they described their mission in their 1962 to 1972 decade report. Um, so their goal is basically to clean up Louisville's image and to clear out messy relics of the past to make way for a new type of city. Um, I think it's really interesting in the way that the Urban Renewal Commission kind of talks about their goals uh, is that they are constantly using the metaphor of disease, essentially. Uh, the blighted buildings are a disease that need to be removed. Um, in the Homeowner's Manual for Old Louisville in 1972, uh, which was published by Urban Renewal and Community Development Agency, they said, the analogy of cancer is an appropriate one because the deteriorated area is like a cancer. It can't be cured and it infects its surroundings. The required treatment is excision. Uh, so demolition was their focus by and large. They were not necessarily focused on renovation. They considered a lot of these buildings in downtown Louisville to be essentially a lost cause uh, and that keeping them around only made the rest of the city worse, for, worse off for it. Um, there is an issue that will come up as we move forward is that they do not give a clear definition for what blight constitutes, however. Uh, very rarely do they give a clear definition or a clear example of what constitutes as blighted. Um, so if they do have a protocol for that, it is not clearly stated to the public, at least. Uh, if they have any specific instructions for that, it is solely internal. Um, Regardless, though, uh, early on in the 19, in the kind of late 1960s, early 70s, uh, the Urban Renewal Commission does boast successes. 
Uh, in particular, they were very proud of um, their ability to get rid of the blighted slums of Southwick. Uh, they had a number of projects that was kind of their first go at urban renewal was their Southwick project. Um, at Southwick, they tore down slums that had the at basically, with, sorry, they tore down slums that featured what they would call the inappropriate intermixture of buildings used for incompatible purposes. And they created new buildings such as a medical center serving U of L, as well as the J.O. Blanton House, which was a high rise that served the elderly and disabled. Um, they <clears throat> uh, bragged, in fact, in the report that the J.O. Blanton House was endorsed by three Negro organizations, according to the report. Uh, which is relevant because it perhaps shows a bid to get ahead of certain criticisms that we're going to get into later, uh, trying to sort of identify where they had community support when they had it. Um, so it's perhaps an attempt to get ahead of certain criticisms. Um, some of the public buildings they boasted, however, were also the public buildings that they constructed in Southwick that they were proud of were things such as jail houses, police stations, and courthouses, uh, which some modern discourse might be more skeptical of how much those are public, those are public good. Uh, which might explain some of the kind of the revisioning of urban renewal in long term. They also wish to follow up their successes, however, um, on the waterfront. So they considered a little. Hmm? Sort of west, kind of like west central, like Louisville thereabouts. Um, they wish to follow up, though, their success at Southwick with a similar project revitalizing Louisville's riverfront. Um, they consider that to be the focus of kind of their next campaign, basically, to clean up Louisville's blighted slums. Um, and that would basically, they would brag kind of about already how they were already kind of on the forefront of that. Um, in particular, they boasted the success of the Galt House, which was just about constructed in 1972 when that first decade report was released. Um, and they also bragged about the construction of new businesses, such as the Kingfish Restaurant, which you can see right here. Uh, the Kingfish on the riverfront, I do not believe is at least the specific kingfish they are talking about, I do not believe still exists. Um, you can see back there, I actually helped process the collection of one of the kingfish restaurants. So I had that photo just on tap. Um, but the sort of new ambitious project to clean up the riverfront takes the form of Shipping Port Square. Um, Shipping Port Square uh, basically was a very ambitious kind of lofty ideal they had. Uh, they wanted to build essentially a new community along the riverfront uh, in the areas that used to be mostly filled with warehouses. Um, with about $37.5 million already allocated to the project, it was to have a complex of apartments, offices, shops, twin 350-seat movie theaters, and a 450-room hotel. Um, this would convert what they would call an ancient wharf and warehouse area into a new community within the downtown area, bringing life back to downtown Louisville. So they had big ideas for what they could accomplish on the riverfront. Um, April 1972 saw a bid war over the project, in fact, um, with Shipping Port Square Associates beating out the Galt House proprietor, Al Schneider, whose proposed project was even more ambitious at 45.2 million. Um, you can see the kind of layout of what the, they wanted to do. Shipping Port Square Associates put, their, put Shipping Port Square in their name, so I think they just had the benefit of that from the beginning. Um, but they wanted to have an office tower, you can see right there is one, um, a hotel at number two, uh commercial office you know shops and like shops and storefronts right here uh movie theater and apartments actually um al schneider's plan was actually even more ambitious in some way um like i said he was the uh built he was the kind of the proprietor of the galt house galt house is still run by the al schneider company even though he's no longer with us um <clears throat> what i think is interesting about his plan put keep this in your memory we'll get back to this is that he wanted to build walkways between uh, the, his proposed developments and the Galt House. Uh, so him, he was essentially proposing to make it an expansion of the Galt House in some ways. Uh, the D right here is the apartment buildings. Uh, he has a big office tower he wants to build. Um, F is dining, meeting rooms. Uh, you can't really see it. It's so see right here in the bottom right corner. He went to build a park, in fact, uh, add some greenery to it. I kind of like his plan more in some ways. Uh, but neither plan is necessarily going to come to fruition in any meaningful way, as we'll get to. Um, <clears throat> kind of moving away from that, though, uh, despite their optimism, uh, there was already some critiques building of urban renewal. Um, in their 1974 report, they state that the, let me see, the um, urban renewal in Louisville and Jefferson County has continued a rigorous program of redevelopment during 1972 and 1974, even though federal housing and redevelopment programs have been under severe attack. Um, 
They claim that their work refutes present claims in Washington that urban renewal and housing programs have not worked well. So they're claiming that it's just sort of a partisan divide that most of their critics are on the opposite end of a political spectrum, uh, you know, Washington politicians. Uh, but this doesn't really seem to be the case as you dig into as you dig into the criticisms on urban renewal. Some of their biggest critiques, some of their biggest critics were simply just Louisville citizens, uh, not necessarily big name politicians. Um, I love this image. You have really well thought out graffiti here. Urban renewal is bad. Um, that makes me laugh every time I see it. Still, um, but uh, a big part of uh, one big problem. One big problem that we see with uh, the urban, how the urban renewal in Louisville carries out its process, um, the way they focus on the idea of blight and disease that these areas are tearing down are somehow a cancer, like a tumor that needs to be removed from the city, uh, is perhaps a bit dehumanizing in terms of how it regards these existing buildings and existing communities. Um, the commission sought to redefine Louisville as an urban space. They wanted to make it something new and reject what it once was. But many people still lived in what they, these areas that they called blighted. And these people didn't necessarily get a say in what was done to their homes, essentially, their communities. Um, <clears throat> the commission was very blithe, however, about how many people it relocated in its efforts and often how little was built to replace these buildings, often very historic buildings that they tore down. Uh, we'll get into it in a bit. But they. A lot of people, a lot of businesses were relocated, but also a lot of residences were, were relocated during this time. Uh, there's a few specific types of criticisms that you kind of see arise specifically against how urban renewal in Louisville operates. Um, one big one is that it disregards existing communities, that it disrespects the city's histories. Um, some people simply don't think that they show good aesthetic judgment. Some people simply don't think they have a good sense of visuals at the city. Just look the places, the buildings they construct are just kind of ugly. Um, and some people simply see it as sort of a venue for businessmen and opportunists to kind of make an extra buck off these, off basically building these new properties, just kind of in the short term, that there's not necessarily long term goals with it. Um, shipping port square is important in some ways, because I think it's going to really embody all these critiques uh, in sort of one easy to understand package, but I'm going to go into some of these critiques uh, and some other examples of urban renewal that kind of went wrong in Louisville. Um, this is a quote from Anne S. Reynolds. Uh, she was a black woman living in Louisville during this time in the 1970s. Um, and as she described the urban renewal efforts on Walnut Street, um, she puts it that we lost our neighborhoods. We lost the close knit, even family relations, not counting the neighborhood neighbors and the whole community. We lost our social identity, really. When they destroyed Walnut Street, they just wiped out the black community, period. That was during urban renewal and replaced it with places like Village West. Um, the decade report mentioned that about 650 structures in Southwick were removed and that 500, 518 families were relocated. Uh, so they aren't just tearing down like abandoned office towers or empty homes, is that a lot of these are occupied by people. Um, they deem a lot of these places to be inappropriately used or inappropriately intermixed within purpose, like residences, businesses, etc. cetera. Uh, but to someone like Anna's Reynolds, uh, her argument is that a lot of these businesses simply couldn't survive anywhere else. That if you move, that it doesn't matter if you give them funds to relocate, that their clientele is principally in this one spot. Uh, you can't just relocate an entire community. Um, Reynolds also bemoaned the fact that this relocation separated many people from opportunities that she had growing up on the community in Walnut Street. Uh, she attended a mostly black school called the Lincoln Institute that she was very nostalgic for. Uh, and she really regretted that other that now other children couldn't have those similar experiences to her growing up. Uh, she actually said something to the effect that if sacrificing all that community was what had to happen so that she could have a soda with a white girl, as she put it, then integration didn't interest her that much. So urban renewal isn't necessarily doing itself much of service in terms of winning people over in a lot of ways. Um, other than breaking up communal ties, it also likely hurt um, just, you know, the perceptions people have of these areas in general. Um, for a comparison, this images are courtesy of brokensidewalk.com. Um, you can see on the left here is Walnut Street around the 1950s, and on the right here is Walnut Street now. This is in some ways cherry picking, obviously. Uh, Walnut Street probably didn't look exactly like this when they tore it down in the 1970s, but it's not necessarily, that's not necessarily what matters because memory and perception are in many ways just as important as reality when talking about the way things used to be. Um, like I said, Walnut Street might not have looked like this when they tore it down, but people remember this. You know, that it used to be a very lively place, bustling with business, bustling with people, bustling with life. And now they know that it looks like this parking lots, empty streets, et cetera. Um, 
So to some people, it definitely feels like something has been taken away from them due to urban renewal's efforts, that there is a loss of community in some way, that Louisville is not as lively or as bright as it once was. Um, there's also aesthetic concerns. Some people simply don't think that they're building much of visual value. Um, as uh, journalist George Barry Bingham uh, described, described, Louisville became a prairie after urban renewal had its way downtown. Um, he was a journalist who wrote sort of a retrospective on the city, basically, uh, describing what it was like to walk around in Louisville during like the 40s, 50s. Um, and he seemed very unhappy with how the city government treated historical landmarks in particular. Um, places like the Board of Trade building were, were torn down, the Board of Trade building being the, we'll get back to it, it's the building that was seen, kind of the cover slide. Um, and he described the new landmarks that were being built up, such as the PNC Tower, uh, which at the time was called the First National Bank building, uh, as mundane garbage. Uh, so he was not holding back. Those were his words. Here it is now. Uh, like I said, it was used formerly the First National Bank uh, and when it was first built in 1972. It was changed to National City Tower in 1944. And at some point along the way, it became PNC Tower as you know these buildings began to change hands. Um, the Urban Renewal Commission was very proud of this building. Uh, they thought of it as sort of a show of scope, uh, scope and scale. It was very just, you know, impressive skyscraper. Could hold all these different businesses and offices. A lot of Louisville citizens thought it was just an eyesore. They didn't think it was especially impressive at all. You know, just a big rectangle. Um, but to give you kind of an idea of the prairie comparison, here's Louisville in 1900, sort of just top down. Just sort of this top-down figure ground map, you can see very dense, uh, lots of buildings, lots of little nooks and alleyways. And here it is in 1990, so the same block, very now very much cleared out. There's not necessarily a lot there. Uh, so urban renewal is tearing down a lot of buildings, and they aren't necessarily building a lot back up. And you can argue whether or not those buildings were of much value, but people felt like they had value, and people don't necessarily feel like what they're being replaced by much of value. Uh, and perception can be reality in some ways. Um, one other big issue we're going to see with urban renewal is that it kind of comes to represent something very cynical for a lot of people. Uh, many people see urban renewal's efforts as mostly just being kind of a land grab, uh, just a way for businessmen to kind of make short-term interests. Um, this is the photo here is a, a hardware store in Old Highland Park, uh, which is an old neighborhood of Louisville. Um, so aside from just leaving empty space, uh, many still kind of view it as a simply short-term profits uh, as being the goal of urban renewal. Highland, the Highland Park of the controversy of the 1980s comes after Shipping Port Square, but it's also kind of important to understand in the long term because it kind of shows you how incidents like Shipping Port Square will affect people's viewpoints of urban renewal on the whole. Um, Highland Park was being blighted by the Urban Renewal Commission during the late 1980s, around 1988. Uh, and it was basically going to be slated for total demolition. So this entire neighborhood was basically going to be bought up and foreclosed to expand the airport. Um, the neighborhood committee actually wins the court case. Um, oh, whoops. One moment. The neighborhood commission actually wins the court case against the Urban Renewal Commission uh, around 1990 or so. And they get a freeze put on all sale of houses in the area. And once this happens, uh, Louisville Mayor Jerry Abramson basically just says, we're going to do it anyways. Uh, he totally gives up on framing it as an urban renewal debate. Uh, the discussion of the neighborhood being blighted goes away as he instead proposes using the regional airport authority of Louisville to condemn the properties to expand the airport. Uh, perhaps the most damning part of this entire story is that the airport has its way. So the airport does in fact buy out these homes. Um, for expansion, uh, demolishes them, moves people out of this neighborhood, and then they do not actually expand. Uh, they leave this totally unused until 2009 when they use it to uh, basically redirect traffic from Trenton Drive. Uh, so this entire area is taken, is torn down and not actually put in good use. Um, moreover, though, this caused a lot of distress for the citizens who lived there. Um, in particular, was one uh, woman by the name of Evelyn Brutley. Uh, you can see her picture here, uh, a bit blurry, but. Um, it, essentially, the court case, the you know, the neighborhood committee challenging the Urban Rural Commission put her in limbo, as Brutley had essentially decided, fine, she wanted, she thought she would live here her whole life, uh, she said at age 77, and unfortunately, she might have been forced into doing that, because the court case put a freeze on the sale of houses. 
So Brutley actually said that she was basically just making peace with the idea of selling her home and moving on, and she was not allowed to um, because of the freeze. So now there was basically no way, even fighting back against the Urban Rural Committee or Commission would cause someone to suffer one way or another. Um, as Brutley put it on her desire to just give up and leave, basically, um, I want my last day to be my best day. I don't want this hanging over my head. The Neighborhood Committee's case uh, ultimately put people like her in limbo. Uh, I thought this would be, I thought I would stay here until I die, Brutley 77 said yesterday. She still might, but not necessarily by choice, as the Courier per Journal put it in 1990. Um, you can see here the airport's expansion plans, um, Sanderford Field, Kentucky Air National Guard. This was Highland Park. Um, and there's Crittenton Drive. Um, basically, they wanted to turn these nearby homes into car rental agencies, air cargo storage, and food service. They don't. Uh, so the people who have to give up their homes and leave don't even get that replacing it. Here was Highland Park then. Not necessarily the most bustling place, but there's homes, there's a school, there's shops. Um, this is around 1920 for that one you can see right there. These were uh, photos courtesy of explorekentuckyhistory.ky.gov. And here it is now. So there's an underpass, some roads. It's just a redirect. It's a traffic redirection, basically. Um, a lot of the criticism of urban renewal is that they tear down buildings and build parking garages. So we can see where some of this criticism comes from. Um, and this is a funeral for urban renewal. This is basically holding holding a funeral for Highlands Park as a neighborhood. Um, the Highland Park controversy happened well after the height of urban renewal. Most of their activities we're going to see are during the set during like the 70s, uh, essentially. Um, but the fact that neighborhood committee stood up to the city and took some umbrage to the branding of blight shows a real change in how the public viewed urban renewal by the 1990s. Um, they had very little faith in the city's ability to make proper use of the urban space. It deemed inappropriately used, and they saw actions such as the airport's you know seizure of these host houses as basically just ruthless opportunism. Um, it was not a pursuit of a public good. It was a pursuit of business interests, essentially. Uh, and that's going to be a major criti critique of how or of how Shipping Port Square is operating, is that people have very little faith overall that it's actually being put towards building a community and that it's being put towards fulfilling the short-term interests of a few rich people. Um, they, they have cause to think that urban renewal is, in fact, as Banksy back here put it, oh, too far back, bad. Um, despite this, moving back to the 1970s, uh, and sort of the prequel of the Highlands Park story, the Urban Renewal Commission was still pretty optimistic about the project uh, way back in 1972, uh, but there were some cracks showing. Um, some people were excited, though, for the project because the Shipping Port Square Associates promised to maintain the facade of some of the historic buildings and potentially incorporate it into new constructions. Uh, one such building was the uh, Board of Trade, Louisville Board of Trade building, which is sort of the precursor to the Chamber of Commerce. It was a historic building built in basically post-Civil War era, um, and it had been around for a long time. It was considered sort of a local landmark. Uh, and so Shipping Port Square Associates has promised to maintain it uh, in some way or preserve it in some way, won them some goodwill early on. Um, Moreover, the Urban Renewal Commission expressed a lot of excitement over the new flexibility granted to them by a 1968 law that allowed projects to be carried out in yearly increments. Um, rather than requiring the completion of an entire plan for an entire project, NDP planning and execution can proceed simultaneously to achieve the year's objectives. Uh, so basically, that they, could, they didn't have to have a project planned out all the way in advance ahead of time, and they could carry out multiple projects at once. Uh, they boasted that this gave them a lot of flexibility in how they approach their projects and how they approach construction. Um, it'll prove problematic, however, as it becomes evident that shipping port project and others were dramatically underprepared to carry out the actual tasks of construction and maintenance. Um, rigidity and focus would have actually probably done them a lot of a lot of good. They should have been less flexible and they should have had it much more in detail planned out. These projects are not, not being given enough attention and a lot of them are not actually going to be brought out to fruition. Um, one of the early challenges, um, some Louisville citizens, like we said, were excited. Uh, in 1974, the commission quoted prominent Louisville citizen Joseph Hammond that Shipping Port Square was the most interesting new development, uh, but they had actually not begun work on it by this point. In fact, by, by early 1974, the Shipping Port Square Associates had not bought out the plot that was supposed to be Shipping Port Square. 
So not only had they not begun construction, they hadn't officially bought the land yet. Um, in 1973, in fact, the Riverfront Commission sought to pause action on the waterfront. Uh, this is a different commission basically kind of tasked with maintaining the water, the riverfront area. Um, and they had support from the aldermen as they contended basically that the uh, deal as it was or the plan as it was did not actually require shipping Fort Square associates to follow through on all their promises. Um, as they contended, the contract, the nature of the contract meant that they actually only had to build the hotel, which is number two down here, uh, and that they actually were not being held to any promises with regards to the office tower, the you know Marshall front storefronts, the apartment was a big one, the movie theater, etc. That they were really only that the contract as it was only required them to build number two, and then they were free to give it up. Um, Shipping Port Square Associates insisted that was not the case, that they were going to take the project seriously and see it all the way to fruition. Uh, but the Riverfront Commission actually went there, what they wanted to do is they wanted to raise the deposit um, from 50,000, which is a pretty small ask actually, to 200,000, uh, because they felt that if Shipping Port Square Associates had to put down a bigger deposit on the, you know, on the pro property, then they would take it more seriously as a developmental you know, prospect. Um, and they argued that since the city was still fronting the property taxes, that this would be a fair exchange. Uh, however, as it turns out, they can't necessarily handle that and that heightened deposit because they're having trouble getting any sort of investment for this project. Uh, Shipping Port Square Associates uh, were not ready for the task and repeatedly failed to find anyone interested in investing. Uh, in, May 9th, in May 13, the initial group, the Shipping Port Square Associates, group, which is formed just to make this one project hold. Uh, so by May 1974, they're done. Um, and they transfer over control of it to the Highball group, who they had basically been asking for investments. Uh, the Highball group, uh, also known as Highball Farms, were basically were pretty well known at the time, uh, and they were well respected in Louisville. In 1949, they acquired a 1,000 acre property, uh, the Hurstborn Estate. Uh, some information courtesy of Jana here. Uh, and they basically developed from the Hurstborn estate over the next like 20 years, they developed that out into what we now consider Hurstborn, you know, in Northeast there, that's a little um, So the Highball group was a pretty well-respected group. They had been known to, you know, build communities almost from the ground up. Uh, so they were a good choice probably to build Shipping Port Square, probably better than the people who just had just formed and just named themselves for this one project. Um, However, Highball cannot find funding either, as it turns out, over the course of the next year. Um, they do purchase the first tract of land in June of 1974, not the entire tract of land, mind you, just some of it. Um, and the, the construction of the hotel begins to go through. Um, the hotel and the some of the joining shops and office complexes, but not the apartment, not any idea of a park, not any idea of the theaters, et cetera, just the hotel, really. Uh, so some of the concerns expressed by the Riverfront Commission might have had some legs that they were just going to be building a couple of hotels and office complexes and nothing else. Uh, they and uh, Highball continued to, find, to seek out investment. They went to the Phillips Harrington Company, which that fell through. Um, regardless of the fact that construction had not yet begun, actually, um, you know, none of this project actually was underway yet. They still tore down all the buildings that were on the tract that was to be shipping Port Square. So the board of trade the historic board of trade building which you can see an illustration of right here is still torn down still torn down the facade of it was supposedly saved but also keep in mind these are different developers now so the promise to maintain the facade that was a promise someone else made that wasn't a promise highball made um further issues are is that the scope of the project is it's going to continue to shrink and shrink in scale and kind of just change all around uh, the proposed site for the project actually changes. They move it. They want to move it a bit east, so it either joins with the LG&E building. Um, moreover, the Highball Group cancels all plans to actually have any residential units in Shipping Port Square. So the idea of putting an apartment there is no longer on the table. So the Riverfront Commission was worried they were only going to build a hotel and basically walk away, and now that is basically the official plan. Um, so you can see right here the criticism of you know opportunism basically. Um, some hoped um, that the sister project, there was a sister project called Five Riverfront Plaza that was going on just so basically a few blocks away. They hoped that maybe that one could fulfill some of the original plans of Shipping Port Square, you know, theaters, a park, apartments, etc. cetera. Uh, they also are seeking to cancel all plans of residential units at this point because they consider it too expensive. 
uh, they don't see the returns as being as viable as returns on, say, an office tower or a hotel, basically. Um, we see time pass, basically, over the next few years with very little progress being made on Shipping Port Square, as it were. Uh, very little comes of this project. Uh, you can still see it being talked about over and over. It still comes up throughout the Courier Journal, throughout their reports, but ground is never really broken on this project. Um, in particular, over the next few years, um, it is the hope is basically for people that Al Schneider, who owned the Gulf House across the street, could partner with Highball, and perhaps they could together build something up from Shipping Port Square, salvage the project, uh, so that the city could focus on Five Riverfront Plaza, the other project. Uh, spoiler alert is that neither of these ever, neither of these projects come to any sort of light. Um, I think there is a typo somewhere in this. Let me see if I can find. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, I thought I was funny, so I put that one there. Uh, I make typos too, though, so I'll forgive them. <laughs> um, by 1977. Um, Schneider has sort of already, you know, Schneider was interested in this project from the beginning, uh, and by 1977, uh, he's becoming, he's become a very active player of this. Um, he was in talks to buy the plot of land from Highball and the city, um, and he's already begun to build uh, parking garages for basically to service the Galt House and hypothetically to service Shipping Port Square, uh, but Shipping Port Square isn't built yet. Uh, there's also interesting talks to build things such as an art center uh, in the Refive Riverfront Plaza, but like I said, none of these have been constructed yet, so they could build a spaceship there for all it matters. It's, you know, it's basically all theoretical. All, they're very much lost in their own minds, imagining what could be at these places, but not really building anything. Um, and the question has to be asked, what good is a hotel to people who already live in Louisville? What good is that to the community there? If you want to build a community, but you aren't going to build apartments or residencies, then what community do you have? People can commute. That one doesn't really resolve the problems that urban renewal had in the downtown area, which such as you know people leaving the inner city area to live in the outskirts. People can commute downtown to work all they want. Um, so they aren't necessarily resolving the problems they thought they were, um, as instead they're just building hotels and office towers and parking garages. Uh, building parking garages to service buildings that don't exist yet, in fact. Um, and I wanted to kind of illustrate this a little bit with some of the city directories. Um, you can see on the left here is 1970, on the right is 1980. Uh, you don't need to really worry yourself with all of this, but you can see um, they got all these vacancies here uh, in 1970. And it almost seems, oh, oops, sorry. It almost seems like they have solved that a little bit. But actually, you can see a lot of these building numbers simply aren't there anymore. Um, you can see right here it goes 300 to 315, but here, 300, and some of these are just folded, some of these building numbers are just folded actually into that one 300 at the FTP building. So some of these addresses have just been sort of folded into the offices in that one building. A lot of them just aren't there. So what most likely happened, you, what could probably happen there was some of these buildings were simply torn down without any replacement. Uh, and the numbers simply aren't there anymore. Um, <clears throat> this is the area that was supposed to be shipping Fort Square as an aside. Uh, so 1970, 1980, not there. Uh, by 1980, thereabouts, the project was essentially accepted as dead. Al Schneider had taken over that plot of land. Uh, but from the perspective of people who actually lived in Louisville, nothing was happening. You, know, you, you could argue that, well, long term, we're going to build something there. But if you're there from 1970 when they announce it, to 1980 when Al Schneider is building parking garages, you're, from your perspective, nothing's happening. No, nothing's being built. Uh, they tore down historic buildings like the Board of Trade building, but they aren't doing anything with that land anymore. Um, you can see right here, Board of Trade building in 1970, it's torn down in like 1975, thereabouts. 1980, uh, and this is the side entrance, and you can see there's the Louisville Gas and Electric Company, um, LG&E building, where Shipping Port Square, the second plot of land they were planning to put on, was going to be next to that. By 1980, also, they just removed all these buildings. Um, so they don't even bother listing them as vacant anymore, because they probably just aren't there. Um, the, uh, this is kind of tragic because LG&E was actually very excited to have Shaman Fort Square built in next to their office towers. Uh, they were pretty gregarious about it and their public statements. They were happy to sell off some, because you can see right here, uh, the vacant, you know, they had a lot of these vacant buildings on that block. They were perfectly happy to sell some of this plots of land off the, and, you know, help Shipping Fort Square get off the ground. But still nothing happens. Uh, the tracks of land are not really developed at all between 1970 to 1980, uh, just demolished. 
Um, you can see right here, this is uh, 4th Street North uh, from Main to River. Um, I thought this one was funny, uh, such some stuff in 1970. You can see there's that kingfish they were very happy about. Um, by 1980, it's the golf house. Uh, so, you know, they've managed to build a big hotel. The golf house gets a bit bigger over time, too. You can see it's got some little businesses in it, uh, gift shops. It looks like a flower shop. Uh, I think there's, uh, yeah, hair cutters. So they're renting out some space. So the golf house is doing well. Uh, and that's relevant because the golf house is kind of Al Schneider and the golf house are kind of the winner in the end of what shipping of shipping port square, not necessarily Louisville, but you know, the Al Schneider company is sort of the ultimate winner of this. Uh, this is Al Schneider. Um, because Al Schneider does take over that plot of land, uh, builds the builds a parking garage, and it's not going to be for a long time that he does anything with it, though. Uh, and there's gonna be some debate among Louisville citizens as to what should happen with the area that was going to be shipping port square. Um, let me find my notes on this slide here. Here we go. Uh, incredibly, the fate of a segment of the city's heritage is, is to be decided not on its intrinsic merits, but in the reaction to one man's vision or lack of it. Uh, that's William Morgan, the architecture critic of the Courier Journal. Um, Schneider, like we said, bought out the land, uh, but he doesn't have any, despite having had once lofty plans for it, like the park and you know the office towers and shops and hotels and apartments, uh, his plans are pretty simplified now. He doesn't seem like he's interested in that anymore, weirdly. Uh, doesn't seem like have, his company is particularly focused on that plot, on that idea. Um, Morgan argues that these projects need, uh, these, the main problem with these projects is that there's not a lot, they, is that they're pretty opaque. Uh, the public doesn't have a lot of say in how these, how these properties are used or you know how these projects are carried out, what's built. Um, he argued that there should be more public discourse on these on this issue, especially as the you know Urban Rural Commission is tearing down these historic buildings, destroying entire neighborhoods, all in the name of ideas that never come to fruition. Um, even if the it, um, as he put it, even if these buildings are expendable, do we really need a garage at this site? Louisville is being asked to sacrifice a chunk of public patrimony so that one man can make a speculative venture even more lucrative. Um, as he noted, the damage has already been done on buildings such as the Board of Trade, but he goes on to ask, do we really want, uh, I, I have a typo there, so I'm, crit I'm criticizing the Courier Journal for what? Uh, do we really want Schneider to build Shipping Port Square? Skeptical of Al Schneider's overall vision and goals. Um, and like, once again, in, in terms of the time period we are talking about, of the late 70s, early 80s, nothing happens. Uh, this construction never begins. Uh, I have right here, you can see this is the glass bridge that Al Schneider wanted to build between the Gulf House and Shipping Port Square. Um, he wanted to connect the two, basically. He does do that, uh, or at least the company does. I don't know if Al Schneider was actually even a part of it at that point. Uh, in 1992, uh, the Al Schneider company uh, completes construction of what he calls Waterfront Plaza uh, on the spot that would be Shipping Port Square and once was the Board of Trade building. Um, which serves basically as an extension to the Galt House. It's mostly parking garages, uh, so mostly parking. Um, there is some offices. There's, a, I think, a W, like a, oh, a YWCA office building is there. There is a Jack Ruby Steakhouse. Um, so that's exciting. <laughs> so uh, keep in mind, that was 1992. So they discussed this first, the first the idea of the project in 1972. And 20 years later, they get an expansion to the golf house. So if you're, you know, someone following the story from the ground from the ground floor of things, this is a very disappointing way to end it. Um, Al Schneider was not beholden to any of the promises of the original developers either. He was not Shipping Port Square Associates. He was not the Highball Group. Um, and so the Board of Trade Building is ne the facade of the Board of Trade Building, I should say, is never incorporated into the construction um, at all. Uh, so, current fate of the Board of Trade building is sort of uncertain. Uh, my colleague Jana told me that it is most likely in an impound lot. Um, the, it is? Okay, that's good. I went to that impound lot in person and asked. I went to see the Board of Trade building facade, and they said, I have no idea what that is. Uh, we don't have it. Go away. Okay, so I'm glad, I'm glad that's confirmation that it is still there. So, if you're lucky enough to have your... What respect for history. Um, 
So yeah, if you're lucky enough to have your car impounded, you can go to Frankfurt Avenue and see the wreckage of it. Um, while you're there, you might also see a car split in two with a baby seat in the back. So that's something lovely. Uh, that's a lovely memory to take home. Um, but one thing that was interesting to me uh, while going over kind of the city directories, this one's from 19, 1965. And you can see right here at the top, uh, the name in the Board of Trade building, uh, mostly vacant. So there may be some legs that criticize the, how this building is being used. It wasn't necessarily bustling, but you can see up here the name Jasper Ward, Jasper D. Ward Architect. Uh, I'm the AIA CKC fellow for, you know, the Pilsen Historical Society. Jasper Ward was a very noteworthy architect during this period, um, and he was a big proponent of urban renewal. And I think there's an irony is that um, he had a lot of big ideas for what urban renewal could be and what it can mean for Louisville. Uh, and the fact that they made him move his office and demolish the building he was working in is maybe symbolic for how the Urban Rural Commission actually saw urban, you know, actually looked at the, you know, the historic center of Louisville. Um, the, <laughs> I'll talk a little bit here about the Board of Trade facade. Um, but uh, Jasper Ward had a lot of big hopes. He was a lot, he was an ambitious person uh, in a good way. I mean, he had a lot of big ideas. Uh, but his ideas are probably too interesting to be built. Um, he also was very excited for what the waterfront could be. You can see his quote here. Um, examples like Village West, Armory Place, extended into the Civic Center, the Medical Center, and the 4th Street Mall, and Northern Termination into the Riverfront Project. He thought the Riverfront was a great place to pursue urban renewal. He had some ideas. He had a lot of big ideas for how, particularly, Louisville could be renovated. He thought these old buildings should be preserved in some way or another. Um, and be you know utilized for something new while still respecting the history, um, and he took this to almost to, to almost a crazy extreme. He was kind of like in a good way crazy. This is um, Ballard Mills. Uh, this is one of the projects I ended up going through as part of processing his works. Um, what he wanted to do was he wanted to take abandoned grain silos and turn them into apartments. Uh, so you can see this idea right here. These are these circular apartment buildings built out of grain silos and kind of the space between them being used for like bathrooms and closets. Um, so he was a person with lofty ideas. You can see right here, um, this was his idea for the Big Four Bridge. Um, you can see the sign up there, Louisville. He wanted to turn the Big Four, the Big Four Bridge into basically a Ponte Vecchio type, type bridge. He was inspired by what he'd seen in Italy. Um, and his idea was basically to turn the Big Four Bridge, which was being un which was not being used at the time, into a neighborhood almost. He wanted to build condos, stores, uh, turn it into sort of a pedestrian crossing area. Um, so he was a very ambitious person, but renewal, urban renewal, the urban renewal committee had very little interest in following through on his ideas during this period. Um, they contracted them a lot because he was a person who was excited about what could be done and you know the future of the city. Um, but the urban renewal commission had very little interest in renovating anything. They mostly wanted to tear it down, and if they were lucky, build something back up. Um, the focus on demolition only really waned by the late 1970s. Uh, by the late 70s, they kind of started talking about renovation more as a focus um, rather than demolition. Uh, but they don't even really keep to that, as we saw with Highland Park, because uh, you know by the late 1980s, they're back at it again. But by that point, people are much more skeptical of them, uh, as we saw with the fact that the, the Highland Park Neighborhood Committee uh, basically fought against their acquisitions of the neighborhood. Uh, the fun fact, another fun fact is that Highland Park resisted, actually. They did not want to be annexed into Louisville. They were kind of their own unincorporated neighborhood town back in the 1920s. Uh, and they resisted being annexed into Louisville, but did actually get pulled into the metropolitan area. And history has likely vindicated them in a lot of ways. Uh, they were probably right to not want to be part of Louisville. Um, but I think the way that, I think the fact that Ward had his office in this historic building that was torn down is maybe in some ways representative, kind of in a poetic way of how Urban Renewal Committee treated, you know, historic landmarks, treated its citizens, and treated even people who were excited about what they could do. Um, with that out of the way, uh, I hope that was in informative in some way. Here are some sources used. Um, a lot of what was used came from the Pilsen Historical Manuscript Collection, uh, and that should be good for questions. So, is this on? Yes, okay. Uh, so I wanna go ahead and open the Q&A. So anybody who wants to ask a question, you're welcome to come up um, and speak into the microphone and I'll go ahead and get us started. Um, so Max, our Forgotten Foundation exhibit, uh, which closes on Friday if you guys haven't 
seen it yet, um, you can stop by after the lecture. Um, so the Forgotten Foundations exhibit sparked your initial interest in urban renewal. Mm -hmm. um, so what drew you to the subject um, and to Shipping Court Square in particular? Um, well, as I was going through the manuscript collection, because I, what I, it's sort of funny, the urban renewal was bad graffiti drew me to it. Um, I just thought that was a really funny, just complete lack of creativity, but that kind of drew me to what, like, okay, well, what were the, criti what were the criticisms of urban renewal? Um, and as I was going through the manuscript collections and I found how excited they were about Shipping Board Square, I was in my mind, like, I've never heard of this place. And I was like, the fact that I've never heard of this place maybe tells a story. And there's maybe something in the fact that that building has no valence on all 27 years of my life. Because um, I lived in Louisville for most of my life. And, you know, most of these projects they were listing, uh, they talked about like a mall on 4th Street. I'm like, that's not there anymore. Uh, so these projects either had a pretty short, these, a lot of these projects are boasting had a pretty short shelf life. And that's really what drew me towards it is what happened to these ideas they had. Um, I seem to remember, I think it was Reader's Digest had a upbeat short article about Louisville building apartments out of the silos. Yeah. And the next thing I knew, the silos were gone. <laughs> yeah, some people, like you know, Jasper Ward, he has lots of ideas like these. Uh, the tragic part of his story, as I'm flipping through, is that some of his most famous projects now are parking garages. Uh, he, he, he was the one who designed, I think, the sixth and main parking garage. And he had big ideas for that, too. Um, for example, he wanted to build big wind chimes over top the entrance of it. That would these like giant wind chimes, like taller, like six foot tall. Uh, and that, it, you know, it was just too interesting to actually do. It was too exciting. Are they still there? Oh. Okay. Okay, so there we go. There we go. Two interesting an idea to actually pursue. Yeah, they put dampers on them. <laughs> For those of you who don't know me, I'm Steve Weiser, and you should have seen my Jasper Ward presentation that I gave a few years ago here. Anyways, a um, couple. Of, by the way, I know Will Morgan. He's still alive. He's up in Providence, Rhode Island. Yeah. I'm going to send him a copy of your. His ears must be burning right now from what he, he, he summed up. He summed it up pretty well. Yeah. He's written a great book called The Urban Environment, Will Morgan, Ur The Urban Environment, that came out in like 1979 or so. Great recap of all of this. Anyways, uh, you didn't name names. So I think, wasn't, uh, and I call him Snyder, not Snyder, but Al Snyder oh, is, that how, is how we pronounce his name. Okay. Uh, and by the way, I called that area that he built down there Snyderville, by the <laughs> way. Yeah, it's Snyderville. But anyways, um, I think he was on the Urban Renewal Commission. Was he not either chairman or vice chairman? You didn't put up the names of the Urban I, Renewal Commissioners, but I think he was on the commission. He wasn't in commission in 1972, because uh, okay. I did look through the names of the people at the time, and I did not see his name. Any prominent names that you want to name names on? Because these people really devastated uh, urban Louisville, uh, the African-American community. Uh, they really did a lot of damage here that we are still fighting. Yeah, I didn't really look into the specifics of them because none of them popped out. As they, they did a pretty good job of anonymizing themselves and their publications and who was making what decisions specifically. Um, but uh, yeah, it, uh, we are still uh, reaping the uh, the bad you know, things that they did. And by the way, they basically ran out of money, and that's the reason why they stopped doing what they just ran out of money just a couple of block a block or so to the south uh, north here or else this building would have been raised as well. They wanted to go all the way through old Louisville. Mm -hmm. They wanted to uh, go all the way. They wanted to take out all West Main Street, all the way to 9th Street uh, and all that. So they did a lot of damage here. But um, yeah, uh, naming names would be good to you know, immortalize these people on all of this. <laughs> but anyways, thank you for your presentation. It was pretty well documented, even for someone not familiar with all these topics. Uh, and by the way, the uh, waterfront uh, had numerous developments. They started back in the 1920s of thinking huge developments along the waterfront. And uh, we finally are now just starting to complete a lot of those. Yeah. So. I was looking into it. There were some people who had ideas. Um, I, some, 
no one's had the idea to revive shipping port square as a concept but shipping port the island i guess the little bar of dirt oh, yeah, a little pink barge thing which yeah. is now a casino down in biloxi some I people think. had the thought of turning that like, like 2000 or so or some people had the thought of turning that into something maybe turning that into like kind of the yeah, similar idea like little shops and maybe little apartments that never came to anything either i wish larry melillo was still around he could uh, talk your ear off on all these topics mm -hmm. if anyone remembers larry melillo he passed away in the early 2000s but he was involved in all of this and mm -hmm. really good guy anyways thank you very much thank you any other questions? Well, I'm a little apprehensive to come up here. I was apprehensive to do it. So but I'm right by the exit. So if, if you throw anything at me, <laughs> I'm going to go through the doors. I was on the Urban Renewal Commission for 17 years. Oh. After the Shipping Port Square. Mm -hmm. Uh, development, which I really knew nothing that that was never on our agenda. So but it disappeared from like, you know, I was going through career journals. It disappears from basically everyone's imagination after like 1978. Yeah. But I thought I might give you a couple of quick comments of, about context. Absolutely. Just because of some of the things that you brought up, and and one that I'm probably the most personally ashamed of is. The blight that you spoke about at the very beginning of your presentation, mm -hmm. the, the blight that was used in the airport expansion urban renewal project, does anybody have a clue what the blight was? No. Noise pollution. Yeah, that was it. So the airport and the people at the airport went to great lengths to like do scans or somehow they came up with the actual number of decibels that were happening in those neighborhoods. And um, so the urban renewal motion was based on blight, based on noise pollution. Secondly, really quick, and I'm not trying to get off shipping port square, but just, oh, that's, just like from a context. You're you know, a primary <laughs> source, I'm excited to have you. Um, ultimately, the urban renewal plan was for the airport expansion project was declared unconstitutional. So it failed. But by that time, as you showed in your, some of your slides, the residents were so fed up and it was like they were at the point of no return and they, for all intents and purposes, uh, sold their properties. The pictures that you have are still pretty current if you go out there today. It still looks like that. Stop um, and one more thing really quick so we had a we had to have a joint public hearing and the the people that joined us were planning and zoning so planning and zoning and the urban renewal commission had a joint public hearing for the airport expansion project it started at 7 p.m i will not tell you the name of the consultant but again i'm really ashamed he read into the record the plan for one of the three neighborhoods and it took four hours so at 11 o'clock at night the floor was open for questions and by then the residents some of which were elderly were completely fed up and we still had two neighborhoods to go so that meeting ran for 12 hours and nobody was there at the end except the commission, of course. We set up on a, on a how do you say that word, dais or dais? We set up there and we had plenty of food to eat and things to drink and all the people in the audience had nothing in there. Just, so there's been a lot of mistakes over the years, but- um, I appreciate you sharing that story. I'm very interesting. I actually. thought I'd add that for your clarification. <laughs> No, of course not. <laughs> that was exciting. I found a primary source in the audience. I'm Stephen Zink, and uh, um, I've got my son who's in the back, who's an architect, by the way. And uh, we've got some very historic properties on East Broadway that we're still working on. And the... Hmm? Yeah. 
um, the mayor appointed, he knew what we were doing on East Broadway and he appointed me to the commission. And so I was on there for 17 years. Woody Porter Jr. was my running mate. He was on the commission with me. I'm sure you know his father. Do we have any other questions? Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh. oh. Okay, so 30 years later, <laughs> just a postscript to that because I, I grew up in that area and I was involved in a couple of advocacy groups, Airport Neighbors Alliance and Community Noise Forum that helped with relocating Highland Park residents. Hmm. And I believe, I don't know what the year was, but uh, a lot of the residents who lost their homes, I believe sued the city and they won their lawsuit. They were awarded $1 in damages. <laughs> and and somebody told me, and I'm not sure I can verify, but they said Jerry Abramson later in the 90s, at some point, was quoted as saying he really regretted all the neighborhoods that were lost because of that relocation project. Now, I don't know if that ever made it into print or that, but... Uh, well, I'm sure they, with the $1, his regret meant a lot for them. Yeah, it was kind of... Um, I don't know what you would call it. Um, I guess kind of a token judgment to say that, yeah, you all were right. They shouldn't have taken your homes. They shouldn't have taken your neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. But here's all it's worth to us. There's nothing we can do. Here's your dollar. Yeah. Got a couple questions coming in from online. Um, okay. So this this will maybe be the last question. Um, we have some people asking for a little bit more context about urban renewal as a movement. Um, so we have, what were the experiences of other cities of similar size towards urban renewal? Um, where did the idea of urban renewal come from and what continued to drive its movement? Um, well, like we said uh, earlier, um, it kind of comes about in the 60s is sort of the context, like the late, well, I guess early 60s even. Uh, we see it come around in kind of like the mid 20th century. Um, other cities, they cite Washington, D.C. as an influence. Um, I haven't really done a whole lot of research into how it plays out in other cities, if I'm going to be completely honest. Uh, but the context they were kind of responding to was the white flight, basically, is the idea that you have uh, more affluent residents are leaving the city center and moving out to suburbs and kind of, you know, outlying areas around the cities, uh, mostly white residents, you know. Uh, that's why I call it the white flight. Uh, so they're trying to hypothetically bring people back into the city center. Um, one of the the thing about like the walking bridge that seems like, you know, because since then the big four bridge is nowadays a pedestrian bridge. And I kind of think that's a joke, if I'm going to be honest, um, because it's a nice novelty to have, but Louisville isn't laid out for pedestrians. Like what, what good is a pedestrian bridge? You know, we can't really walk around Louisville. Yeah. yeah. It's a nice novelty, but uh, my point, I guess, is uh, you see a lot of, I don't, I don't necessarily have a whole lot of context for urban renewal in other cities. Like I said, they listed Washington, D.C. as an inspiration. I think one of the, I think at some point they may have listed Philadelphia at the time as an inspiration also they were working off of. Uh, but uh, my impression is that urban renewal projects haven't necessarily, in, in other cities like D.C. kind of went to similar tracks at times. Um, very much sort of in favor of demolishing the old buildings to make way for new. Uh, yeah, I don't necessarily know if they... I can just kind of add to what you're saying as far as urban renewal is a very common movement in cities across the country at this time period. And so other cities of similar size are seeing having a lot of these same issues. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. So I think we'll go ahead and wrap up. It's one o'clock. So thank you very much, Max. Thank you very much. And... Uh, if you are interested in this at all, do check out the Forgotten Foundations exhibit. Once again, that's last chance to do it, I believe.